and we could do. I mean, did someone else ask a question and uh, did not hear what they need or the complete for it? Okay. Can you ask a question? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think if okay. you, even if you don't ask a question for the wrapper, you can just throw it in and then we will wrap it at the end. So. And the model with the question was a nice idea, I guess, but never yeah. didn't work out so, so well. Okay. Yep. Just so you're ready. Almost. Cool. You can still ask. Okay. I have got a question. You have a uh, question? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, Very well, sir. Is there an API or something like that for not interactive? For not interactive? <coughs> You mean fetch? Yeah. yeah, yeah, sure. You can you can directly do fetch. I mean, it, it is it is basically identical to your home desktop environment. So whatever you do on your desktop with a big cluster in the background, somewhere you know in your data center, you can do here as well. Yes. Yeah, with this uh, nice CCD. But could you could you do it? Up? No, no, no. Just, just want to push forward here the the agenda. In about twenty minutes. But, but send me an email. You have my card? Yep. So yes, Bart, just <coughs> start talking, I guess. Yep. That will cut them off. All right. Well, we have enough time. That's what I thought, but yeah. still. More, more okay. or less. Oh, no, yeah. OK, so I'll uh, well, more or less briefly talk about uh, Docker volumes and hmm. particular BGFS. So quick overview of what I'll be talking about. Um, well, very shortly touch upon Docker. I'm not going to explain what Docker is, obviously. Then explain about uh, volumes, uh, what types of volumes there are. Um, briefly touching upon plugins. Then covering BGFS um, as a well, solution by itself, the Dockerized uh, stack that we did. And in particular, the BGFS plugin. And if there's plenty of time, uh, there will be a, a short demo. So, um, well, I work for Red Cool Beans. It's a new company focusing on um, secure and integrated Docker stacks. I'm also an OpenB, so that's by daytime, and at nighttime, I'm an OpenBSD developer and have been for almost 10 years now. Mostly, thank you, <laughs> mostly working in uh, ports and packages, so that's porting third-party applications, uh, but also working on um, the Oction uh, platform, so 64-bit MIPS uh, CPUs. Um, some details on where you can find me or haunt me. So Red Cool Beans, as I mentioned, secure Docker stacks. Um, we noticed that a lot of people just take an image from the hub and spin it up in production, fingers crossed that it runs. And if there's ever a security update, uh, the next guy will look into it. Um, well, that's obviously not really secure. And as mentioned, if you download something from the hub, you just have to trust the provider of it that it does what they uh, say it does. Um, and we really want to make a secure and integrated stack with which the, uh, the application at hand. So there are three open source projects um, we started and actively con contribute to, obviously. So that's Cargos, a minimal approach to the Docker host OS. Uh, there's Docker Lint, which is a linting tool for Docker files. And as I understood, there's also a uh, plugin for the Atom editor. And there's Crane, which is our well, new approach to Docker image provisioning without a package manager or anything left in the, the final image that can be, um, well, rather to have a minimal attack surface. So no package manager, no extra recommended dependencies uh, that Debian or others try to uh, well, enforce upon you. So uh, Docker, as we, or as I see it there, have been two major hurdles in the adoption. It was networking and storage. And this has been an issue for a long time, but granted Docker is still quite new uh, since they open sourced in 2013. And for networking uh, between con containers, there were basically two uh, options you could do inter-container -communi inter communication through links, 
which, as I understood, they were trying to deprecate uh, anytime soon, which is a good move. Um, so containers, or sorry, links rather, they are like hard links between containers. And you cannot, without forcing it, uh, break that link. So a link between containers, um, so you link your web container to your database container and give it the symbolic name DB. And inside your web container, uh, you can reach the database container through the DB short name. And it's also uh, recorded as such in the hosts file, which is great um, for single host deployments. Uh, if you want to do multi-host networking with Docker, um, well, you really have to like pain. I think that's the uh, most accurate description. And of course, there was the uh, so-called ambassador pattern to sort of circumvent the problem with links, but then uh, scaling out to multiple hosts. Uh, so basically, you have a proxy container on each physical node, which proxies the connections between the uh, containers on one host to containers on the, the other host. So with, I believe, Docker 1.9, um, there was the Docker, Docker network uh, subcommand intru introduced, which um, took some of the ideas from the Weave Works. What well, it's not a plugin, uh, but a, a solution on top of Docker, which in the early days of Docker uh, made multi-host networking a lot easier. It was still kind of icky to set up, but it worked. And given there was nothing in Docker Core, well, it did the job. Um, and Docker Compose uh, eventually took hint and it took notice before, um, and they had the uh, experimental um, flag to enable net <coughs> networking between containers, and eventually with Docker 1.9 uh, well, in the main branch. And the nice thing of Weave, even though it was an external project, it wasn't developed by Docker, it did um, create a large interest from the Docker folks to well pull that functionality into Docker itself. Even though nowadays I think they're sort of deprecated. But well, I guess that just happens. So containers are ephemeral by definition, I might say. Uh, you spin it up for as long as you need it, and you kill it as soon as you don't need it anymore. Whereas data is, well, more or less forever. And Docker is great for um, like HA proxy containers or Nginx, where you don't give a rat's ass about state. You just want to do what it's supposed to do, and logging you can ship to another container which handles logging, and um, the con container itself doesn't know any state. However, most applications, I might say, do have state. They have logs, they have um, other data that they cannot <laughs> ship off, uh, like your content management system or any other application that writes data to disk uh, is a stateful application. And there are, um, so that's where volumes come in to keep that data. Uh, after you kill and, and remove a container, you sort of want to have access to your database still or your uploads. Um, so that's where the, the volumes um, come in to store data or state outside of the container that you spin up and kill and spin up and kill. They also allow for sharing data between containers in a non-network uh, fashion. And of course, they do allow for backup replication without encoding that knowledge into a container. Uh, for example, we did a proof of concept with the Bakla file daemon. Um, so the way it worked was that we have a bunch of more arbitrary containers with data in them, and none of them uh, had Bakula installed. And we had one Bakula FD container, which mounted the volumes from those containers and 
that container knew what had to be backed up, and that container was the only one that would talk to the Bakula director and, and storage daemon. So it's uh, volumes also allow for backup in a non Docker CP or, or TAR uh, fashion. And of course, it allows you to utilize external or clustered file systems such as BGFS. So there are essentially two types of volumes. You have your named data volume and data volume containers. And I'll go into them uh, in a few. So you have your, um, your data volume on a host. So in this case, we uh, just do a Docker run and the minus V is for, well, short for minus minus volume. And we map the uh, Docker DB directory from the host into the container at the uh, slash DB directory. So from the container's point of view, it only knows of slash DB and, and what's actually on the host file system, it, it doesn't know, it doesn't need to know. Um, so these are, are created on the host, and well, that's by definition not portable, uh, unless the underlying storage is somehow shared. And, uh, but you cannot take this container and spin it up elsewhere and hope that all your data is, is, is still there. So then there are the, the actual data volumes. So you have the anonymous volume, which you don't name, as you can see. Um, but you say that in the container it's mounted uh, as slash data. And the moment you remove the container, the volume is gone, and so is your data. So that's not always um, what you're looking for. So in that case, a named volume comes in. So you have your data volume as a symbolic name and you mount it into the container at slash data. And the moment you kill and remove the container, that volume will still be there. And, and of course, your data um, will still persist. And of course, you can reuse um, volumes from other containers in the fashion with the Bakula file daemon, as I just described. And you just say, um, you have your regular docker run command again, use minus minus volumes from and then the name of the data container which has the volumes that you're interested in using in your uh, well, the container that you're firing up over there. So that's a way of storing data in containers instead of using the host file system for that. And this way you can distribute your data, uh, for example, some, some bootstrapping data or uh, other data that you want to distribute. You can distribute those along with the application containers. Of course, there is a, a, well, a certain penalty for the, the copy and write file system um, method that Docker uses, but it's well, the margin of error. So it's, it's uh, well, uh, something you can easily ignore. There are also some security implications of using volumes. Um, there is no restriction on, on sharing the volumes or, or the data in the volumes. Um, with recent Docker versions, this has changed a bit, however. For example, the BlockBridge plugin allows for authentication through their external service on whether or not you're allowed to access and, and use the data from a volume. Um, well, there was also the boot to Docker situation. Um, I assume most of you on, on OS X have used boot to Docker. And it would expose the slash users uh, directory into the uh, boot to Docker uh, VM. So that means that any container running under boot to Docker would have access to your entire slash users directory which is equivalent to slash home uh, on, on most other units. That's not really something I was um, happy to find out, given that an arbitrary container then had access to all my files and not only read them, but also remove them.
So then the Docker plugins uh, came along, um, <coughs> as well as the Docker volume uh, subcommand and, and well, API that goes with it. And this allows for external parties to write a plugin for an arbitrary backend, uh, which will then handle the storage of your files. So there are well, plugins for most any networked file system, mostly, uh, because that's what uh, was hard to, to solve in, in, in the beginning. So there's NFS, there's SIFS, there's uh, ClusterFS, GFS, uh, well, IPFS as well. And, well, not now, but uh, recently we wrote a plugin for BGFS. So, taking a step back, um, BGFS is a, it's an open source um, clustered file system. Yep. Um, they open sourced um, or, or made it redistributable quite recently. Um, and it, it works great on, oh, sorry, it's easy to set up. It's just a, a, a very small number of services that you run, as you'll see in the next slide, or second to next. Um, and really, it's a, you can set it up in like five minutes. Of course, you have to tune it and, and uh, adjust it to your setup, but in, in five minutes, you can have a BGFS cluster up and running. And it does excel on, on, on regular commodity hardware. I mean, you don't have to have big fancy storage cabinets or, um, well, you do want to have some, some storage optimized servers, of course, but it, it works fine on a laptop as well with reasonable results, um, which I may show on in, in two uh, vagrant instances later on. And it's developed by the Fraunhofer Institute, um, so they have some some experience with uh, developing new uh, technologies. So a quick overview of BGFS. It's, well, as I mentioned, it's easy to set up, but it's also a very simple architecture. Um, so if your storage server's at the bottom, which well, um, can be any kind of a, any number of uh, devices, you have your metadata servers on the side, which kind of uh, look at what's going on and, and um, talk to the clients about where to store what, uh, any um, uh, like ACLs or file system attributes um, are handled by them, uh, the metadata servers. And of course, you have your clients which uh, don't need to go through metadata servers or through the management server in order to well, fulfill the, uh, the write or read operation. And this whole well, setup is um, monitored by the management service. So there are three services in the um, BGFS setup. And well, why not dockerize those? Uh, so we have the, the management, metadata and storage, and it all worked perfectly fine. I mean, it's, it's just a, a process, and as someone mentioned, if you can start as a process, you can well, put it into a container, which we did. And then we had a look at the client. It works. Um, I mean, you can access the BGFS mount from within the container. You had to load the kernel module on the host, though. Um, and that's probably where the, the big issue with the client came from. If you try to stop the uh, first three services or containers, it would just work fine. You could kill them and remove them. However, the client would get stuck. Uh, Docker Compose would uh, crash. And Docker, the actual container, would just linger on forever. Um, but why would you want to use a a client like that in a container when you can offload that to the host and, and uh, leverage the Docker API and, and plugin infrastructure, which we did. Uh, oops, sorry. The Sabi stack is available on, uh, on the Docker Hub on the Red Cool Beans account, and it's also available on GitHub with a Docker Compose file, so you can really get uh, up and running with BGFS in a matter of minutes after downloading the images, of course. So the plugin, um, well, it's sort of reverse order, but in case you have 
internet access, you can look at the repository already. We provide packages for uh, all Debian-based distributions as well as Red Hat-based distributions. So it does require some things up front. Um, so it's not really plug and play. However, everything is, is handled by your init system already at the moment you want to start your container. So Docker 1.8 is a requirement for the API endpoints that it talks to. Um, the plugin acts as a service, so it comes with its own systemd unit file. Um, the kernel module is loaded on the host by the um, BGFS helper D service, and you need to have the BGFS uh, share mounted into the appropriate location. Um, and the plugin does actually check for that, because at one point I was happily writing out data into my volume, and at one point I found out that it wasn't actually writing onto BGFS, it was just writing onto a local XFS file system, which well, wasn't quite what I expected, so the plugin has a check for that. And actually it's, it's fairly simple in, in how it works. So it's, it acts as a bridge between um, well, the, the Docker API and, and the volume command or, or client. Um, so the, the, the key thing what the plugin does is it maps the symbolic volume name to a uh, directory on the host which is mounted as a BGFS file system. And of course it checks the online FS type, um, but that's really all there is to <coughs> it. It communicates via the API and it just passes along and, and makes sure that the, the volume you're trying to write to exists and Docker knows about it. So, well, there are some obvious use cases here. Um, you can use it for uh, continuous integration, delivery, have Jenkins write all its artifacts to your, uh, your already present BGFS uh, setup. With redundant storage underneath it, um, but the really nice thing comes with multi-host Docker clusters or live migration or just plain migration of containers between um, hosts. So that's what I'll briefly show. Okay, so here we have two uh, Vagrant instances um, running BGFS, and so as you can see, it's mounted at the uh, the first node, and trust me, it's also mounted on the, the second one. I'm not going to show you that it's actually working um, BGFS outside of Docker, so I'm just going to show you that the plugin. The Docker volume plugin is running, and that's how uh, um, Docker knows how to communicate with it. So, as you can see, there are currently no volumes that Docker knows about. So, I'm just going to create one and show you that. Um, so this is the command to create a new volume, uh, docker volume create. We tell it to use the BGFS driver and this um, instructs docker to use the plugin which identified itself as BGFS. So that's the service um, that, that's running. And we give it a random, semi-random name of volume one. And as you can see, uh, docker no knows of it, where previously it didn't. So, um, let's launch a container. So we have a busy box container. And uh, since the host names are random, we're just gonna copy the host name file into data, which is on BGFS. So then on the, um, the other BGFS node, which is 
not running uh, a Docker container at the moment, we can see that we the file has been copied over, um, and the volume, the so the directory, is the the volume name. Um, so for time's sake, I'm gonna uh, stop here. However, this is a, well, a super trivial example, of course. Um, but you can imagine doing the same thing with your Postgres database, uh, storing your Farlib DB, um, Farlib Postgres, onto a BGFS mount, kill your container on the first node, spin it up on the second, and your data will still be there because it was shared and handled by BGFS. So, um, I will put this readme up along with the, in the link of the slides and with the uh, fragrant boxes we've made available as well, so you can play with it yourself. Are there any questions? All right. No questions. And I think the same applies. So, I mean, BGFS is already an HPC parallel file system, so. Yeah. But the same applies to Luster, I think, as well, right? So all this, all this other parallel file systems. But yeah. I mean, you should use BGFS, obviously. Yeah, because for many reasons. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. Maybe, maybe one question oh. here. Sorry, it's going to be late. Uh, no, no worries. I will wire it up and then we will ask the question. So, maybe any performance figures regarding uh, the mounting or using BGFS in Docker? Uh, because I'm not sure if if I have performance figures? Yes, yes, any, any, any performance comparisons. So do you use some or any performance at all just because of the fact that you are accessing the UGFS from inside the container? Yeah. So, yeah, you are losing a little bit of performance. Mm -hmm. um, well, obviously, because it has to go through the um, well, Docker layer, so to say. Um, but it's still, I don't have any numbers with me right now, but I can provide those as well. And it's, um, it's in line with what you'd expect from a bare metal uh, access. So it's, it's more or less in line with the IBM report then? Yeah. If, if, you're, if you're aware of that. Yeah. Okay, good. good. Thanks. All right. Okay, cool. Thanks, Jasper.